I wanted to talk a bit about the Justin Green recovery campaign. And just before we do that, I wanted to just acknowledge this moment. Um, you know, we're in, a, we're in a time of massive change and disruption to our lives. Um, and I just want to welcome all of the emotions that come with that, whether that's grief and sorrow or frustration, anxiety, insecurity, or whether it's excitement and passion and motivation. And I just, I want to welcome that in our speakers tonight um, and also in all of you who are watching this at home or watching it recorded later on. Um, this time that we're in has exposed the massive inequalities within our society that were already there, but they've become more, more visible um, through coronavirus and other events. And it's, it's great to see so many people on this call and just in general, people engaging with the idea of a just recovery. Like, where do we go from here? We, we can't go back to normal that was already so devastating for so many people. We need to go forward to something better, to something that works for people and for our planet. Um, and that has, to be, that has to be broad, it has to be systemic, it has to touch all corners of our society. And so we came together um, as Friends of the Earth Scotland and the other organisations on this call um, and loads more. We, 80, 85 organisations so far have come together in a campaign to call on the Scottish Government to deliver a just and green recovery um, that does just that, that delivers for people and planet and not for big business. Um, and we, we sent a letter to the First Minister as the very first step of this campaign, which is hopefully going to grow and go arms and legs and go in all sorts of directions. And that letter laid out five steps that we think are important for delivering delivering this just and green recovery so i'm going to talk through them really briefly now and then our speakers on the call will go in more detail about some of these different aspects so the first one is about providing good public services that are publicly funded so funding our healthcare, our social care um, our education, um, our public transport, all these things that we've realised we need for, um, for a society that works um, for our housing, for instance. The second step is about providing adequate incomes for all. So it's about tackling the inequality within our society, redistributing wealth um, and, and tackling those social issues that mean that some people are much more marginalised within our society than others. The third one is about our climate obligations, so providing new funds to meet our fair share of climate emissions so, and restore nature and biodiversity so that we can um, deliver on this for people in Scotland but also people around the world. And then strengthening democracy and human rights and making it so that communities and people can engage with our democracy. Um, you know, reducing police powers and surveillance as much as possible, as soon as possible, uh, and making our society more participatory and, and more democratic. Then the final one, we're not in this alone. The final one is about supporting an international response to coronavirus and to the climate emergency, um, whether that's equal access to vaccines um, or yeah, delivering on our climate targets. So, We've got five amazing speakers tonight and we're squeezing in quite a lot. Um, so they're going to be speaking about different aspects of this campaign. So first of all, we're going to have Stephen Smiley, who's from Unison Scotland, who's going to be talking about um, public sector workers and, um, and the unions and, and, and the areas in that that we need to strengthen and, and work together on. And then we're going to have Benitha Ira Dukunda, who's from Edinburgh in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Um, I'm sure that you've all seen the global movement for Black Lives that has got the attention that it rightly deserves over the last few weeks. Um, and she's going to be talking about the organising that's been happening in Scotland and how racial equality needs to be central to any kind of recovery that is actually going to create a fairer Scotland. And then Zarina Ahmad from the Council of Ethnic Minority Voluntary Organisations is going to be talking a bit more about um, how we can address the societal injustices that have marginalised some of our communities more than others. And then Elliot Hurst from Climate Camp Scotland will be talking about 
our climate obligations and the kind of transformation that we need to see that will make our, our society greener um, and reduce our emissions in a fair way for workers and for communities. And then finally, Liz Murray from Global Justice Now will be talking about that international aspect and um, touching on a few different areas where we need to be part of an international movement for, for justice. And then finally, I'm just going to come back and talk a bit about how you can get more involved in this campaign going forward. So we've got loads to get through. So I'm going to pass over to Stephen, who's going to start talking a little bit about um, public services and public service workers. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, all the 85 organisations um, who are part of this uh, coalition. I think this is a really exciting development in unison um, as the, uh, you know, the, the largest union in Scotland is really proud to be a uh, part of that and hopefully uh, other unions will join the coalition in, in the coming, coming weeks. <clears throat> For the past nearly three months now, we've been in lockdown with the economy slowed down, schools and universities closed, foreign holidays even staycations cancelled, mass at the afternoon ritual of checking the football results at quarter to five stopped, and even that wee small hole in my weekend that I've not been able to work out how to fill yet. The sky is clearer for us, and I've not been in a city for three months, but I'm told that in the cities, uh, the, the, the air is much clearer, it smells nicer, it's just a, a nicer environment. People realise that birds sing uh, all the time, make a lot of noise in the morning. It's been quite a strange experience uh, for us. Millions of people have been unable to attend their workplaces. Some fear that they'll never return to those workplaces. As many companies, particularly in the leisure, tourism industries, are saying that once the government's job retention scheme, the furlough scheme ends, they'll need to make tens, hundreds of thousands of people redundant. And some of these companies are already going to the wall. However, for other people, other workers, the rhythm of life has barely changed. The supermarket workers still work seven days a week from early to late. The distribution drivers are still on the road. The posties still deliver all that junk mail and bills. The energy workers keep the lights on and, and the gas flowing. The home care worker still arrives at their first service user at half past seven in the morning and says cheerio to the last one at half past ten at night. The care home worker still arrives for their 12-hour shift to look after the residents suffering as they are with the isolation of no family visitors and restricted to their own rooms. And in our National Health Service, our cleaners still mop the floors and wipe the surfaces, the nurses still care for the sick, and the doctors still prescribe and aspirate and ventilate and operate to save lives. We've become used to these workers being referred to as key workers. For weeks, they clap for our key workers. Politicians praise their key workers, newspapers lauded their key workers as heroes. And for those key workers, their working lives continued they had to wear more masks and gloves and face shields and spend more time washing their hands than they did before. And they've had to live with fears that didn't exist before. But their working life stayed pretty much the same. And the fears, of course, are very real. Unison members have spoken to us about how they're worried sick about catching the virus when they're in working in care homes and places in, in, in NHS, taking it back to their families. Oh, and this is a really important point to make for them. Their fears were as great for the risk that they had of taking it to the vulnerable service users that they support, lest they cause them harm. At a meeting of our National Executive Council last week, the names of 66 Unison members who have died from the coronavirus were read out as we sat in silence, humbled by that fact. And these fears are, of course, greater amongst our black members. Of those 66 Unison members from from the names that were read out, it's clear that a high proportion of them are from black and minority ethnic communities. And our survey that we conducted our black members in Scotland demonstrated the highest levels of anxiety were amongst them. And they were less likely to complain to managers, possibly because they fear negative responses or their experience in the workplaces that they don't get listened to anyway. So for all these workers, their working lives continued amidst the pandemic and the fears Except they became not home carers, shop workers, or nurses, but they became key workers. They became key. key. That suggests that they're important, essentially even critical to the function of their industry, to their community, to their country. And therefore, they're valued by society. And of course, with this key, important, essential, critical, and valuable role, they will be recognised and rewarded 
that would be just. Care workers got offered a badge. Matt Hancock, health secretary, cabinet secretary, whatever his title is, he wears that care badge. He wears it with pride, apparently. But for many people, actually, the care, they look upon that as with a bit of contempt. We've not had a pandemic like this before. Well, we've had crisis before. Crisis caused by natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina or the tsunami that killed thousands in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. We've had crises caused by unnatural disasters like military coups in Chile or war in Iraq. And the crisis caused by the financial crashes. 1929, if we read our history books, but more recently, one we remember the experience in 2008. And each of these crises is, is memorable for the human and sometimes ecological cost, where we can recite the number of deaths, the number of unemployed uh, that were created. However, they're also memorable for what came after uh, that suffering of the victims, the poverty of the homeless and displaced, the burdens that are placed on working people, the austerity that is inflicted on them to pay for the crisis, the additional taxes levied to repair infrastructure and keep essential services, function the pay freezes and wage cuts that are cut when employers find a surplus of workers looking for jobs. The cutting of services, closure to play facilities for kids' libraries for commute and so on and so forth. I'm sure everybody in this room is aware of what we've experienced over the past 10 to 12 uh, years on the financial crisis. The way the key workers, so crucial at the time of the crisis, are regularly forgotten about when the crisis is over. Their value no longer measured in praise and applause, but and minimum wages that are paid, the reduced pensions that they can look forward to in the longer hours they have to work to earn a living. Naomi Klein explained in her brilliant book, Disaster Capitalism, that in a time of crisis, there's always someone who sees an opportunity to take advantage, to profit from the situation, gain more wealth, more power, whilst ordinary people are disorientated and weakened. We have already seen how profiteering has taken place in this pandemic. From the place of surgical masks, which used to be Round about 25 pence each when they were being purchased. Now they're about £2.50 a mask. That's a thousand percent increase. Somebody's making money out of this. We've seen employers in the construction and construction industry advertising jobs at rates of pay significantly less than they were before the lockdown. We see big tax dodging offshore based care companies like HC1, for example, who fail to treat staff with dignity, fail to the wages when they had to isolate to protect the residents and colleagues when they had symptoms, failed to provide suitable PPE for their workers, and ultimately failed to protect the one well they were supposed to be caring for, putting their hands out now to the government asking for bailouts to protect their profit making for their offshore shareholders. When unemployment reaches the levels we last saw in the 1980s, as is now predicted, the pressure on wages will be immense and the minimum wage at zero hours will, all be, will be all that's an offer for millions of people. And key workers, well, they'll be told they're lucky to have a job. That's what happens after crisis. And if history is repeated, that's the future post-COVID. Some will profit, whilst the workers, the new, for the new workers, the new normal, will be horrifying, brutal and unjust. But that's why Unison represent hundreds of thousands of key workers, social care, education, Waste and environmental services and the NHS, private, third sectors and public sector have joined, are proud to have joined the ATO organisations in Scotland calling for just and clean recovery. So we will we'll demand, we are demanding and will demand that public services are protected, that essential services are, that kept us going during the pandemic and the essential services that we need to be restored, like education and mental health services, are funded properly. We will fight to ensure that the legacy for social care workers is more than a badge. They must be paid a decent wage. Some of the key workers currently in care homes are not even paid the Scottish living wage of £9.30 an hour. That needs to change. We will be led by our black members and allies. Ally ourselves with those fighting for justice for the black minority ethnic in the workplace and in society as a whole. We as a union will campaign so that those people who suck profits from care homes to take, our, take those profits to the Cayman Islands and places like that are removed from our care sector, and that care homes become buildings designed to provide care and not to generate profit. And remember, remember those clearer skies and nice smell in the air in the cities that I referred to earlier at the outset? Well, we're going to work with you and many other organisations to try and keep those so that the key workers and all workers have a better environment to live and work in. So I would just end at that. And say thank you to Friends of the Earth and the other organisations for taking this initiative 
the build this coalition for a just and green recovery. And I would appeal, as I said, to all other trade unions to join us in that. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephen. People are clapping in their videos, I can see. Um, it's a slightly <laughs> weird thing on an online call where you can't like show your appreciation. You can react, might be nice. We can react to speakers um, if you have that option. Um, but yeah, it's really like, I'm so happy that Unison's involved in this campaign and there's a couple of other unions as well that are involved, like the Communication Workers Union and Living Rent, the Tenants Union. Um, and it's so, like unions have really, like it's i think a lot of people are seeing how crucial they are to our society and for justice at the moment um, so i'm going to pass on to benetha next who's going to be talking about the movement for black lives matter in scotland and across the world oh there we go done it hi is that okay perfect yeah you can um, so I'm from, I currently live in Edinburgh. I've been here for about 20 odd years. Um, and yeah, I got involved as a collective with the whole organising because it's something that's close to my heart. And I've firsthand experienced the racism and the prejudice that happens in Scotland and all over the UK. And it's one of those things that when you watch it happening like worldwide, you still feel that same hurt. It doesn't really go away. It just kind of like you resonate with them to a deeper point. And like you can feel it. Uh, um, yeah, so as an organisation, the Black Lives Matter movement is a collective of liberals who believe in an inclusive and spacious movement. So we are trying, yes, Black Lives Matter, but we do include the other people within that, such as Black trans, Black LGBT, Black women, and so many different aspects as to how Black people can be victimised just other than being Black. Um, they also believe that in order to win, they must have um, a move, they must move beyond the nationalism that is to all, all too prevalent in the Black communities and they must ensure that they are built on a movement that brings um, all of us to the front. Um, yeah, that kind of feel like that. And I feel like even with the whole planning in Edinburgh, we were all very much like, I feel like a lot of people forget that Scotland has a black community and like to forget that black people exist here. Just because we are such a small minority compared to down south, it's kind of like we are kind of wiped away and just kind of shoved under the rug. So even that was one of the things that we found quite important as a group organizing that like, we need to raise awareness that we are here, we are present, and we are facing the same experiences as people in England are facing, people in America are facing. And just because they don't have guns here, it doesn't mean that they don't have the facilities to kill us, as you're seeing with the whole coronavirus experience of the BAME community dying. And just like Stephen said, me, myself, I'm a support worker. I work in the care industry. And it's weird to watch how, like, the care industry is so unprepared. And every week I'm kind of going into work and just like, oh, this is a new guideline and this is a new PPE. And I'm like, it should be the same is what the NHS is getting because it kind of makes me scared to go home to my own family. I think. Um, but yeah, with the Edinburgh one, um, I think it was very good because we all kind of, as a group, we all kind of took what we felt we were what best at working in the sense of, I did like some social media and connecting with people and stuff like that. So we all kind of worked really well together and we all kept up like every day it was kind of like in the morning, this is what we need to do and then we worked on it and then got together at the end of the day. But it went really really successful and there was a lot of doubts from Nicola Sturgeon herself and even from the public in general that we wouldn't be able to do it with socially distancing in place and one of the things that made me so so proud on the day was that everyone kept in line with it and everyone respected it and we fair enough we had to remind people but it was still very much in respect and everyone knew that aside from the virus being a pandemic we were there for the much bigger pandemic that is racism and how it occurs. Um, as a group, since like prior to the event, um, we've kind of like gathered up some key movements that we want to work on. So we're looking at the education and curriculum and trying to um, get the UK to kind of speak on the fact that um, the UK was involved in slavery and Scotland and like our ports were involved with it and things like that. And just trying to raise awareness because when I was growing up in school, when we did Black History and when we did things like that, it was all it was so focused on America that it took until I got to college and it shouldn't take till you get to higher education for you to find out about the place you live in it shouldn't like I was so astounded even recently I've only just found out about the St Andrew's Square thing and now I'm like oh wow there's more than what I actually learned in college and things like that so we feel like it's important for that to be added to the curriculum but also the history of African culture like celebrate there was kings and queens that came from there and 
celebrate all the other things that came in just so people can be educated on things around the world. Um, we want to also focus on the mental health of the black community and what like what happens after you've had the racial experience? What happens after you've watched all these racial experiences on TV? Because I feel like the only point of call that people have at the moment is to phone the police. Whereas if you phone the police for an assault or something else, you'd have a follow-up. Whereas for racism, it's kind of like, oh, we've dealt with that person and that's it. No one really checks in to see how you're coping and how you're recovering from that incident. So I feel like mental health is a big thing in the black community. And also it's very hush-hush in our community as well. Like It's only now that like the younger generations are discussing it, whereas even with my parents, I feel like sometimes we clash on it in the sense of we sometimes can't speak on it because we don't quite understand, but it's because it's not spoken about in our community. It's very shamed and very, like, it's, it's viewed as a bad thing. Or if you're mental health, it's kind of like, you, there's no in between for the depression, anxiety, and all the other things. It's kind of like, you're either fine or you're in a hot institution. There's no barriers in between. Um, we also want to look at getting more black teachers into schools and into universities because the statistics that have come out for that and how little representation there are in schools and how little black teachers are in schools is really very very low and it's kind of like i read something today that there's only 50 black professors in the uk and that's quite like a shocking number considering how many num how like many numbers of black people there are living here and black educated people as well um, so I think it would be quite important for like kids to be able to see like black faces in the education system because it would kind of motivate, motivate them and they would also feel like they're being seen and that they are represented in their school and things like that. Um, we want to also make a safe space for people to come forward and express their needs and how they feel their needs aren't being met within the UK and things that they feel like they would need for like they're even the local area because we get a lot of places, black people are kind of populated in the same place. and it's one of those things about the distribution of people and the distribution of housing. So in the area that I live in, it's considered like a rough area, but I like it there because I, there's faces that look like me there. So it's kind of one of those things of, do I move out because it's a rough area or do I, like, and then go into a white place where I can face prejudice or do I stay here and just kind of be with people? Not, even though there is prejudices there, but it's not as bad and it's not as rife as what it would be in like a higher end area. Um, so yeah, just creating a safe space where people can kind of come forward and even with what they've come forward, we can take that on to the governing bodies and to the council and things to kind of let them be heard. Um, also, in line with the coronavirus research with the uh, BAME community. Hold on, baby. Um, but the, sorry, that's my son. <laughs> He's in the background. He's on the phone two seconds. If you need help, go and ask the auntie. Oh, okay, go and sit with auntie. She'll help you. Um, okay, I'm going to mummy then. So, um, yeah, so even with the whole, say hi then. No, no hi. <laughs> so with all the research that um, was found out with the coronavirus in the BAME community, I think it's a big thing that needs to be discussed in the UK is what opportunities can we give to the black community and what can we give them better job prospects? Because a lot of them, even like my own parents, came to the UK with degrees and they come with so many different levels of education. but because there is that language barrier, which I do understand, they just kind of get put into other jobs. And yeah, you can draw them on the paper. Can I um, your yeah, you can draw on the paper. But they get... <laughs> hmm? Yeah, you can still draw. It's okay, mummy's talking. Um, but yeah, so they kind of get shifted into jobs that people like. And it's a weird... Open. It is open. But it's a weird place to kind of be in because it's like, when you read the papers, you get a lot of people that are saying, oh, they take all our jobs, they're doing whatever. But it's like, these are the jobs that you don't want to do. And at the end of the day, we need to survive. We need to pay our bills. We still need to live just like you. Because a lot of people come to the UK with no recourse to public funding. So they literally have no choice but to take a job that is given to them. And then this is how it ends up in that. Um, so I think that would be quite a good thing that we should try and get for people. Um, I'm a girl. Hold on, go on that side, please. I'm still reading. <laughs> so we also, I need to read it. So we also suggested that. Um, okay, so you can sign it. So we suggested maybe going into schools and discussing what um, teenage people and also just younger schools as well in primary school and discussing what the black community in the schools feel like they would kind of like for their teachers to address and. Because even I feel like when I was in school, if I experienced racism, if I raised it with a teacher, it was kind of like an assembly and it was like a one for all. And that was really like, once you've had the assembly, that's the conversation yeah, done. Whereas well. I feel that more conversation should kind of happen within the school and with teachers and pupils themselves. And just that education of 
this is how a person feels and they should be more I know but I have to break it so you can draw there you go you can keep drawing them on as well I've got this so there'll be more um, kind of space for those conversations and I feel like even as a pupil in school if your teacher wasn't too afraid to kind of have that conversation you would feel more comfortable to go to them and address the issues that you're facing um another point you said is a platform we want to try and generate a platform for the younger black community to connect because one of the organizers was saying today when we had um, a phone call that she didn't realize it was this many oh that's fine we'll wash it off (laughs) so she didn't realize that um, there was quite as many black people in edinburgh as what there was at the event and um yeah so she was saying like i think it would be quite good to kind of have like a platform for everyone to connect and to try and make friends within the community and also find other people their age and stuff because I feel like a lot of my friends that I have now kind of came from like my mother's friends and it was like their children that I kind of like I don't need to break that one but um yeah they kind of my friends kind of came from like my mother's friends kids that we all grew up together and then take that there for me and then you draw this there you go Okay. okay we'll put it on the floor um sorry guys but um, yeah, so I feel like it'd be quite a good thing for them to be able to connect together and just there's more than social media because it's one of those things that like, you don't really want to be creeping on someone's page and be like, I just added you because we're black, like, hi. Um, so yeah, I think if there was like a safe space to come, even if it was like a community centre or like a youth group that was held, that would be a way for them to kind of connect. But um, to kind of do all those things, we do need funding. And that's another thing that um, we want to raise awareness for is the funding that is coming to that well, the lack of funding for the um, black community like supports and the things that they're getting. So we also had suggested funding for migrants to get jobs in their field of expertise. So when people come over, if they can't speak English but they have the correct um, qualification, maybe if we've got funding for just like an English lesson, like English lesson, so that then they could learn the language and then go into the workplace instead of them having to struggle and be destitute. Go and find the other pens in the other room. I'm sure you got uh, pens in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so even if they were to get funding for that and their expertise, that'd be a good thing. And another thing is that we wanted to highlight was that we don't want it to be everyday protest. We don't want it to be an everyday like we want to fight, we want to do whatever we want to get over. Which is yes, it's all well and done. We need our rights and we need this stuff. I changed the color. Um, but yeah, so we also want to raise that, but also we want to have a celebration of black culture and just kind of the culture that we can bring here. Okay, yeah. So we want to celebrate the black culture in the African community by um, hosting, there you go, by hosting like African parties and obviously they're inclusive for everyone. It's not a case of like, we're doing this for us and no one else can come. We just want it to be a celebration that people both, like, both sides of the community can come and embrace the things that are happening in this country. So I suggested, um, when I was younger, there was like these African parties that used to get held and one of the things that stopped those parties getting held was lack of funding from the government and council. So we want to try and bring them back. And then we also want to um, celebrate the independence day that most, the country, most African countries have from when they lost, when they gained their own rights back and when the colonization ended. So we want to celebrate the fact that like we've lost, that the shackles have gone off kind of in that kind of sense. Um, and also focus on like black, hist- like have black historian days and celebrate those and do things for like, there's two versions of Black History Month, so there's February and October, and even if we could just solely focus those months and just raise awareness within the community, host parties, host things that will then celebrate things and just be like, yes, this is a time to remember the struggle and the civil rights that went on, but also this is a time to look at how far we've come. It's not very safe. So we want to look at how far we've come from that point in life and also celebrate those. And even just incorporating like the artists that are in Edinburgh that do um, Afrobeats and there's like certain artists that perform Afrobeats and rap music and things like that. So trying to incorporate them into being like noticed and stuff like that. And we'd also suggested a block party like for the summertime, which is quite an American thing, but I feel like it would be quite good because even in Edinburgh, there's a mailer um, event that happens at these links. So we were kind of like basing it around that and like, it would be a case of like, yes, it's going to be a block party, but it'll be like black businesses can come and sell things at their stalls. Um, people can do dances. People can do like, they can do different types of um, drama and arts and things like that. And just a way to kind of embrace the black people living in Scotland and a way to promote black businesses and other things. And also just to highlight that we can celebrate the fact that we live here, we live here and we can celebrate the fact that we are doing well and try and bring awareness to those.
and yeah just okay I'll fix in a minute sorry my son's literally like battling me <laughs> so I kind of went off yeah so I think as a group we all really wanted to just yes we want to get justice and yes we want to raise awareness for the inequalities of everything going on but we also do want to celebrate that we are here and not be ashamed of our culture and not feel like no one wants to be part of it because it's one of those things of like there was quite a few plaques that I'd seen at the um, protest and there's a red one there you go so um, I'd seen quite a few placards at the protest and it was saying that um, it was something that if you love black culture love the people the same way so it's one of those things that if you think you can there you go I'm going to wrap it up quickly because he's literally at the end of his tether <laughs> But yeah, so it's one of those things that I feel like. Okay, I'll take them off in a second. I'm almost finished, baby. Um, but yeah, so it's one of those things that we really want to highlight the indifferences and get justice and get the fair treatment that we need. But we also do want to celebrate things and bring both communities together because I feel like without prejudice, everything can be easy, and it should be okay. Okay, there you go. I'm gonna wrap this up, but I'm gonna have to end the call as well if that's okay. <laughs> but thank you for listening thank you for taking the time and yeah hopefully I'll catch up with Kate later on and hopefully um, I'll see what else she's said but hopefully we can gain justice and hopefully we can fight this corner <laughs> thanks so much Bye, guys. and thanks for your son for contributing as well <laughs> I'll speak to you soon um, bye, bye yeah I mean, we all live and work in our homes at the moment, everyone, all parts of the family, very welcome on this call. Um, yeah, I think Benevin made loads of really amazing, um, important points there, and both about how we need to be tackling injustice, but also celebrating what we have, um, which is a really important part of a, of a recovery and of a, a movement towards something that's better and works for everyone. Um, so I'm going to move quickly on to Zarina, um, who's going to talk a bit more, uh, expand on some of the points that Benetha made, I think, about um, how we can work towards so greater social justice within Scotland. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Zarina. And as Kate earlier on said, that I work for a race equality organisation called Senegal Scotland. Right. My role has been, over the last 10 years, to facilitate and manage the Ethnic Minority Environmental Network. Um, and the aims of this network has been to engage people, be a neat people across Scotland in environmental issues, but also to diverse, to diversify the environmental sector and to create a platform for BME voices. So that's my job and that's what I've been doing. And um, it's a difficult task, it's not always easy. Right, um, but recently, I think like we've all heard about the, pand um, the COVID-19 and the pandemic caused by it, it has highlighted even more the, the existing inequalities in our society, especially when we see the disproportionate numbers of BME people being affected and dying from coronavirus. Right, so somebody who's a BME person and who's had COVID-19 and is str struggling to recover from it, and hence my voice is not very strong at the moment, um, it's been a very scary place. Um, so knowing that nobody's actually doing anything about it and not yet are looking at the reasons why BME have been affected more, but actually taking action has been very low. And I think that's where it becomes really scary. So yes, we know that there are a number of underlying factors such as health inequalities, so things like housing and overcrowding, lack of green space, employment, the high risk, low paid jobs, all of these do contribute to the disparity. But what it's ha is shown to me is how Britain um, and other places around the world have actually failed to protect the most vulnerable and poorest people. And that's where I think we need to start taking action. So over the last few years, um, we as a society, I feel, that even equality organisations, society as a whole, activists, have actually been sitting back when it comes to looking at equalities and inequalities. Um, they've been increasing, gaps are getting bigger, wider and wider, and more and more people are suffering. However, I am positive and hopeful that going forward now that we do have a chance to address some of these issues and that we can do that within that fairer, just and green recovery plan. 
So the emphasis of the letter put forward to the First Minister was to move away from the economic recovery, which I think is very, very key and crucial, to put in society at the heart of any recovery plan. Having goals of well-being, sustainability, and inequalities, and environmental destruction, all of this is at the heart of that recovery plan. So as a society, I feel that we are not moving, like I said, that we're not moving towards looking at inequalities, and we're not moving forward together. We have not been in it together, and there very much exists a we and you culture, a me and them mindset, and the othering attitude. Right? The global systems and structures in place, unfortunately, are guilty of further creating these divides. And this, this is what needs to be changed. Right? So what can we do? Right. Give me a second. Right. So firstly, we must understand what and where existing inequalities lie in our society. Because I don't think that's fully, actually fully understood. Right? Um, so generally speaking, we know that there are nine protected characteristics under the Equality Act, which um, show discrimination, that you can show discrimination. And um, we should definitely familiar, familiarize ourselves what these characteristics are. So that things like class, gender, sexuality, disability, gender reassignment, we should look at all of these and actually understand what they mean. So that when we are looking to put things into policy, looking to think, put things into change, that we are addressing all of these issues and not excluding people in society. Right? And also we must remember that as, as individuals don't actually neatly fit into one box, therefore intersectionality must also be recognised and an importance put onto that. Right? Now looking into history, and history does matter because history is where we can get a bit more of an understanding about inequalities and the reasons why particular groups with particular surnames or phenotypes experience injustices is linked to the stereotypes developed centuries ago to justify the enslavements of African black people and colonialism in Africa, Asia and many other parts of the world. So knowing this history gives a better understanding why ethnic inequalities persist today in Britain and the deep-rooted race thinking in our society. So we need to dismantle all of that and understand that before we can actually start to tackle inequalities. Right. So the areas in our society where we experience the most inequalities, so when I'm talking about we as in the BME community, is employment and the labour market, housing, health, transportation, financial services, education, the judicial system, civil society participation and pl political influence. So this so inequality should equality should underpin all policies and go, go across sectors and it shouldn't just be about an add-on or an afterthought and this is what I think sometimes you get really frustrated because when we think about equalities we always just think about maybe a tick box for a lot of people. And I think it's really about making sure that we have an inclusive society, right? So consideration must be given to both inequalities and climate change to mitigate impacts on vulnerable and marginalized people, make sure that any climate resilient action or post pandemic recovery does not further compound inequalities faced by many of us. Right, secondly, who are vulnerable and marginalized people? So we hear that term quite a lot, or often I hear the term hard to reach to describe those that are marginalized. And I argue so often that this is just a get out clause, especially when we think about those people who in our society are actually um, marginalized. So I'm gonna give you a list of those people that could be marginalized. So that's women, the elderly, adolescents, youth, children, persons with disability, indigenous population, refugees, migrants, and minorities. So these are all the type of people that experience a high degree of socio-economic marginalization. So as you can see, this is a significant proportion of society, definitely not hard to reach, right? So marginalized people become even more vulnerable in climate emergencies or indeed in any emergencies due to the following factors. Right, well, these are just some of the factors, right? So there's the occupied areas prone to climate impacts, lack of access to services and resources, 
have inadequate or no access to political influence. And I saw earlier on in the chat where somebody said to, ben to Benetha to become an MSP, and I would second that. Please do get into, pol into politics. Um, depend heavily on the informal in economy, so they have the low paid jobs, uh, have limited capacities and opportunities to cope and adapt, and have limited or no access to technology. So by understanding some of these issues, we can start supporting the capacity of vulnerable populations in emergency. We can start giving them priority to the needs of vulnerable and marginalized people. And we can create capacity to engage in decision-making processes. Failure to implement any of these simple actions lead to further gaps. And lastly, how do we have an inclusive society? So I get asked this lots of times. Right, so first of all, this redistribution of wealth and resources. Right, so we do need to have um, to provide a fairer wealth and inc income um, distribution. We need to make sure that when we're accessing funding and resources, that we provide expertise, capacity, time, space, not just monetary. Um, so additional resources are also needed. Ensure that the financial needs of modernized communities are adequately met without creating this competitive environment. And that often happens. So you have to prove yourself and the need why you are more important, which creates a competitiveness. And, and that breaks down unity and that breaks down collaboration, that breaks down working together, which is so important. And then value the so-called low-skilled jobs that many BME people have. And it's starting to put value on work. And then once you put value on those work, you're also valuing the person. Right? And, right. and then moving on. So we need to also stop doing to and start doing with. So let's not make assumptions that you know best and, con and start consulting, having dialogues, engaging and finding out what the needs and priorities are, and then take steps to help. Rather than thinking that this is what needs to be done and then going to meet those needs. Use your privilege, right? Start to advocate for inclusion and non-discriminatory access for those excluded. Don't just leave it for those certain individuals to continuously fight for their rights. Right? Expand your lens. Think about who's around the table, who's making the decisions, who's being consulted, who is influencing decision makers, who is in your circle, both professional and social and personal. Because without hearing different perspectives, it is difficult to change the status quo. And then go be with these voices to be heard. So also recognize that there, and also recognize that there's diversity within diversity. So just having one person re representing BME doesn't actually show diversity. Right. Okay, and then the Black Lives Matter movement. This has been a really crucial point in history for me because it's highlighted that we, as we all know, the systemic and institutional racism which exists. But more importantly, it's the move from no racism to anti-racism, which has been a catalyst for change. That's why we've had a call for action. So now is the time to go beyond non-discrimination approaches, but we need to have positive action to see systemic changes in our institutions both in their practices, outcomes, and representation. So any recovery plan needs to have a clear, accountable action plan. And finally, there must be social and climate justice at the heart of Scottish Government's recovery plan, ensuring that the existing inequalities inside, in society are recognised, addressed, and tackled, and vulnerable and marginal people in Scotland being, are being protected, equally valued, and part of an inclusive society. Thank you. Thanks so much, Serena, and thanks for doing that, even though you're not very well. <laughs> That's <laughs> Feel okay. free to go and rest if you need to. <laughs> yeah, I stay, I stay, I can stay. I'm all right. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'm going to move on quickly to Elliot from Climate Camp Scotland to talk a bit more about um, the climate impact. Yeah, first of all, good evening. Uh, I'd really like to thank all of, all of you who are here, um, wherever here happens to be for you. Um, so yeah, I'd like to, to say something about how climate change is part of this green just recovery and also how the demands that are articulated in this letter align with the vision of Climate Camp Scotland. 
So to start with a simple fact, amidst all of the, the coronavirus madness, uh, last month was also the hottest May ever recorded. And that's true both in the UK and for the whole planet. Uh, so as, as you can see, if you look at the letter, it's really about responding to multiple crises, uh, both the corona pandemic and, and also global heating. And I think at, at this point, it's a very open question how, how this pandemic is going to reshape society. Many unthinkable things are becoming possible, but that's both good and bad. Uh, so it's really important that we have these kind of coalitions and that we do uh, try and shape it towards the good. So I'd like to start by saying something about Climate Camp Scotland as a coalition, as a network, whatever we are. Um, <laughs> collective, I suppose. Uh, Climate Camp's guiding aim is to shut down the fossil fuel industry in Scotland. And why is that? Uh, because in our view, doing our fair share with respect to climate has to include keeping oil and gas underground. The commitments that we might make regarding climate finance, uh, listening to indigenous communities, debt cancellation and reparations are all crucially important. But these also, in my view, seem a bit hollow if we don't stop making the problem worse. And every extra day of pumping from our oil and gas fields is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is powering global heating and ultimately is violence towards vulnerable people worldwide. And having an honest account of our history and how we've contributed to the current global situation is obviously also so key for understanding what doing a fair share means. Now, in, in order to achieve that, that vision, Climate Camp decided to focus, first of all, on Moss Moran uh, in Fife, where there are two uh, processing facilities for fossil fuels owned by Shell and Exxon. And for local people, these are a pervasive and discomforting sight, noise, vibration, smell. So we take action here as an ally of the Moth Moran Action Group, who are a frontline group, who've been fighting to, uh, in their own words, uh, get some redress from the long-term social, health, and environmental impacts of these Moth Moran facilities. And I feel like it's important to point out that the lockdown hasn't stopped any of the flaring and noise at Moss Marin. All it's done has meant that SEPA have rolled back their monitoring, while the increased asthma risk in the community that these plants cause is obviously intersecting with uh, you know, vulnerability uh, to, to a respiratory pandemic. So sadly, the, the climate camp that we dreamed of uh, that was going to be happening about a month from, month from now is obviously not possible. Um, but this is only a delay, and we're still working out how we can uh, really act in, through online campaigns. And anyone who shares the values of Climate Camp Scotland is, of course, very welcome to join. So that's that plug out of the way. Uh, so I think one of, the, one of the key alignments between Climate Camp and, and the values in this letter is that we are guided by our vision of a just transition. And that's one that puts people's health and well-being first. And, and of course, good jobs are part of that. So this is about really keeping hold of the kind of values that this crisis has made us recognize. The importance of care, looking out for those who are vulnerable and protecting lives. And just because the impact of global warming is diffuse and often far away, it doesn't mean that it isn't deadly. And the, the 85 signatories of this letter show just how widespread the support is for a just transition. And as I see it, I really hope that all of these organizations will be contributing according to our strengths. So for Climate Change, uh, Climate Camp Scotland, uh, the just transition is a process that really focuses on justice for workers and local communities, both in Scotland and around the world. And that that just transition comes with building a new normal that is Scotland without a fossil fuel industry. 
Now, Moss Morin is, of course, just one part of a network of oil fields, gas fields, pipelines, refineries, processing plants, export terminals. So as a concluding thought, obviously shutting all of this down is a project of economic transformation. And I think this letter uh, points out very nicely what is required here to make that transformation a just one. Whether it's jobs and sustainable travel, renewable heat, affordable local food, employment opportunities for young people, and also retraining for affected industries. And government funding will be needed to support those. So that to me, these are all extremely reasonable demands. And while climate and coronavirus are at the forefront of our attention right now, as Climate Camp Scotland, we're also very aware of the need to tackle some of the underlying causes, the intersection of racism, colonialism, and a toxic economic system. Capitalism is not fit for our needs. It creates and indeed relies on vulnerability, marginalization, and inequality. So the vision that we have of a, a green and just recovery is about social and economic revival. And, and to me, I really like that word revival with its kind of links to uh, vitality, um, that it means ditching fossil fuels and ditching the mad drive for growth at all costs and instead caring for life. And I hope this campaign will be a real force for change in that direction. So thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Elliot. Um, and I'm going to pass straight on to Liz from Global Justice Now, who's going to talk about the international aspects of uh, just recovery. Thank you, Kate, um, and thanks to everyone who's come along tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know Global Justice Now, um, we're a campaigning organisation and we focus very much on the, the structural or root causes of global inequality and poverty, um, particularly focusing on the economic system and the political decisions that make, um, that make and keep people poor. Um, and and we and in campaigns we focus particularly on corporate power and how that undermines democracy, fuels inequality and environmental decision. So, um, um, uh, but we're really pleased to be part of this campaign here in Scotland, calling for a just green recovery and to be working together um, to make something positive from this crisis. So please do get involved. Um, it's just at the beginning, and we need uh, we more, need more than ever to work together across all these different issues that we're hearing about tonight and many others and I, I think there may be more um, events like this to follow with other speakers talking about other things so um, uh, and, and really in many ways right now we're at a turning point you know the decisions we make now as a society and the actions we take in our communities the pressure we put on politicians to ensure that, ch that things change for the better will very likely shape our lives for generations um, what comes from the coronavi coronavirus pandemic the climate emergency and now also this moment of um, of, of real growing understanding of systemic racism has to be something better and something more just. So let's use this, let's use this opportunity um, to do that. Um, and as others have said already, the coronavirus pandemic is really laying bare the inequalities that exist here and around the world. Um, even, in the, in, even in the wealthy countries, years of austerity combined with a, a market knows best ide ideology has really undermined the ability to deal with coronavirus. Um, you know, we heard Stephen talking about public services and, and they've been starved of money. But even so, our governments ha have been able to take the kind of action um, really only seen last seen around the time of the Second World War to direct economic activity, control markets and increase public spending. Um, uh, but for many countries in the global south, a history of being colonized and exploited and then followed by decades of structural adjustment um, forced on them by the global institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, as well as a global economy that continues to be rigged against them, has stopped them being able to build any sort of welfare state and left them at the mercy of the global free market. Um, and that's left them in a state of permanent crisis, which is where many countries, um, where many countries in the, glo in the global Global South today are when it comes to dealing with this the new and enormous challenges of coronavirus and also the climate emergency. 
Um, but not to worry, the West has told these countries, it's true, you can't invest in public services, but that doesn't matter because the market will provide. Um, and in the last 15 years, the UK has played, a, um, has played an increasingly leading role in pushing to use international development funds um, in aid money to encourage the private sector to invest in the countries of the global south. So rather than supporting countries to build public services or to help them collect, um, to, to help them collect taxation from the multinational corporations already working there, uh, the idea of the UK government and um, and the US as well is to use public money to make things more conducive for international capital to invest. Um, at the same time, the governments of the rich countries, and particularly the UK and US, have led the world in putting corporate power and profit ahead of human rights and environmental, environmental protection in other ways too, uh, through enforcing unjust trade rules and the privatisation of basic services and utilities. They've also allowed a system of, um, of intellectual property rights and patents to give big pharma the ability to make profits on the back of the public money that goes into the development of new medicines. Um, and they've let the global finance in industry in fact they've helped the global finance industry gain huge power so as we're looking for ways to rebuild and recover from this pandemic um, and to address the other crises of global inequality and, and the climate emergency we have to do it in the knowledge of our global interconnectedness um, and by being aware of the systemic changes that need to happen um, so it, it, obviously this is an enormous issue and sometimes it can feel like it's so big, where, where do we start and what, and what do we do? So um, from our, our point of view, Global Justice Now, um, some of the things that we think, uh, the kind of changes that we want to see um, and that we're, we, we're working towards um, begin with unpre unprecedented solidarity with the Global South. Um, and that has to include sweeping and uncondi unconditional debt cancellation. Um, and the, the global campaign for that has gained a, a huge new momentum in the last few months. It's been going for many years, but it's really, um, it has really found a new, new momentum. There needs to be a massive injection of funding to build both emergency and long-term public sector capacity um, and long-term fundamental changes to, where the glo to the way the global economy works, from financial policy tools through to radical changes to taxation and international trade rules. Um, so Scotland, Scotland really should get behind the call for debt cancellation and, um, and actually the Scottish Government has shown some support for this idea but we also need to support the call for governments to have the tools to regulate international capital flows and protect their economies from the chaotic and profit hungry behaviour of international markets um, and there's never been more need for attacks on financial speculation. Um, so also needs to be political commitment to clamping down on tax havens um, and while that needs some global coordination in individual countries can take steps right away um, global trade rules that demand endless liber liberalization and give corporations huge power and profit making abilities through the use of intellectual property rights and the so-called corporate courts um, as well as undermining government's abilities to act in the interests of the public and the environment need a radical a radical rethink and right now Scotland has to say no to a trade deal between the UK and the US. Um, there's public money going into the development of new medicines um, including treatments or, or, um, or a vaccine for COVID-19 and that public money has to should have must have conditions attached so that big pharma can't sell the medicines those medicines back to the NHS or any other health service in the world at hugely inflated prices. Um, and the Scottish Government actually has um, something called a Crown Use Licence, which it could use to stop the price inflation of medicines. And we're calling on them to use that in the case of any COVID-19 treatments. Um, any bailouts of companies have to be seriously questioned. And if they do go ahead, then they should have conditions attached um, relating to things like reducing carbon emissions, paying workers a fair wage, withholding bonuses and dividends, and probably many other things too. Um, and when it comes to international development funding, then a radical rethink, we, we're, we're suggesting a radical rethink is required, which um, 
should be based on reparations and wealth redistribution and support for public services. Um, and at the same time, the governments, including the Scottish government, should prioritise this idea of, um, of policy coherence, which, um, which really just put simply just means checking that, one pol that a policy in one area doesn't undermine positive action or policies in other areas. So, um, for example, when Scotland is thinking about its economic policies, say in energy or transport or its trade policies, um, Oh, and its economic policies it needs to be it really needs to be aware of what impacts those policies are going to have on um, on other things like climate change and inequality um, and also what it's going to mean for um, or what impact it might have in other parts of the world um, because this pandemic the climate emergency and the global and global inequality require urgent and radical economic reform um, unwavering faiths in the market is not going to solve these problems. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that, um, but only, it'll only exacerbate them. Um, and dealing with this crisis requires a fundamental economic reset to build a world which puts people and the planet ahead of corporate privilege and profit. Um, so with this campaign, it, um, I th we think it's really important that we make sure that out of the crisis comes a future based on meeting, meeting people's needs and prioritising a dignified life for everyone everywhere on a livable planet so we need international cooperation and solidarity based on equality and human needs and respect for the planet not big business bailouts and the cutthroat race to the bottom so things that were um, previously unimaginable have suddenly become reality and in this moment of such profound change let's let's reshape our imagination to what's possible and make it real thanks Thanks so much, Liz. Um, and yeah, thank you to all of the speakers um, who've touched on several different aspects um, of, of this campaign. There's obviously more to this, like we're talking about a, a whole system change here um, and there's voices that haven't been included in tonight. And as Liz said, hopefully there'll be lots more space for those to be included um, and have more and more conversations about this. Um, I'm just gonna talk a bit about the campaign and ways to get involved. So all the things that we've talked about and all those um, visions for a better society and a fairer world are like great, um, but it's gonna take a lot to get that. It's gonna take a lot to get this change. And so we need this campaign to be really big. And we've started that by getting as many organizations that share our vision as possible on board and um, hopefully more will get on board um, as we as we go along people are sharing commonweal stuff in the chat commonweal are also involved in this um, so definitely part of those conversations as well as well as many others um, so to win this campaign and to win any aspect of this campaign we need to be using all of the tactics in our campaigning bag that we have in our toolkit so we're going to have people working on more specific policy demands that we need to be telling the government and local authorities exactly what they need to do to deliver on these on this vision um, so we'll be having people who are kind of doing that work um, behind the scenes, chatting to decision makers and um, making that kind of change and then we also need big mobilizations and we need local organizing so that people are pushing for this from all, at all levels of society. Um, we, we're going to have key campaign moments so we'll be pushing around all of the, um, the big moments when our government will make decisions about what our society looks like so that might be the budget, the program for government, around the elections next year um, and then other big moments like potentially school strikes or the, or the COP um, or other big international summits that are coming to the UK. We're going to be working with our friends down south in the Build Back Better campaign um, to, who are pushing on Westminster to change. We're going to be working with them and potentially doing some collaboration um, work so we can get this message out really, really um, far. And I'm just going to share my screen again to talk a bit about what you can do. That's not the right one. Here we go. So the first thing we can do, really low bar, you could do it tonight, um, is to sign the petition. So we've taken the steps that are laid out in the letter that I talked about at the start, and we've made a public petition that you can sign up to, to show that you, as a citizen, support these ideas and this 
this path towards a better society. You can also add your organization's name to the letter if you're part of a group, whether it's a community group um, or an, a, some kind of institution, you can add your name to the letter and to strengthen that. Um, we're gonna put out posters in the next few days that you can print off and put in your windows or um, make your own to show all your neighbors that you want a just recovery that you want to build back better um, you can we'll be doing a social media campaign within the next couple of weeks and i'll send out all the details for this in the follow-up email um, where we want people to be posting on social media and telling all their friends that they that they want this to happen and starting those conversations and then for people who are really interested in getting involved at a local level we're going to have a local organizing call on the 24th of june and um, where we're going to be talking about what you could be doing in your community how can you be um, working towards this in a way that's appropriate for your area and um, what will we trying to identify what the key things are for different areas and how we can equip communities to be able to be pushing for this at a local level as well as a national level um, and there'll be many many more um, steps in this campaign as it builds and grows momentum um, it's quite emergent because we're seeing who gets on board and who wants to be part of this but we know that it has to be it has to be big like we have as Liz said this is the decisions that are made now will impact our lives for years and decades to come this has to be this has to be the time that we make massive change